finally, I looked at him and I said, you have to give me 30 seconds. And he said, for what? I said, just give me 30 seconds. So he said, okay. And I looked at the floor and I just said, I can't believe Ray Manzarek is in my apartment. <laughs> I can't. And I repeated this about 10 times. And then I looked at him and I said, okay, I'm done. I'm a writer. I know dialogue. That's a fountain of conversation, man. That's a geyser. Interesting. Interesting. Yes, provocative. Oh, daddy, stand back, man. Woo! Rock and roll! Welcome to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Find the podcast at bookedonrock.com. You can find every episode of Booked on Rock there, along with links to your favorite listening platforms, exclusive videos, blogs, links to all of the social media sites, and the latest rock book releases. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. It's another chapter in the Dialogue series, a chill and chat with authors, fellow podcasters, musicians, and more. Two very special guests joining us, Stacy Weidlitz and John DiNicola. Weidlitz is an Emmy-nominated composer and songwriter. He co-wrote She's Like the Wind, a smash hit from the soundtrack to the 1987 film Dirty Dancing. He was nominated for an Emmy for his contributions to the ABC series World of Discovery. And he's written compositions for various films and made-for-TV movies, including Disney's Pocahontas 2. Dina Cola is an Oscar and Golden Globe-winning Grammy-nominated songwriter and producer. He's the co-writer behind two of the most enduringly successful songs in music history, I've Had the Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes, also from the Dirty Dancing soundtrack. Weidlitz and Dina Cola are here to talk about their amazing careers, their songwriting process, and the massive success of Dirty Dancing. Weidlitz has a great story about meeting Ray Manzarek of The Doors and his friendship with Jeff Skunk Baxter of Steely Dan and Doobie Brothers fame, who is also a missile defense consultant. Dina Cola tells us about his love of the Beatles, how he helped to launch the career of Maroon 5 by producing the band's very first album back when they were called Kara's Flowers. He's also got a new documentary on Peter Lewis of Moby Grape. He'll tell us about that as well. Here are Stacy Weidlitz and John Dina Cola. John and Stacy, thanks for being on the podcast. Let's start with a little background, where you guys are from and how music became a part of your life. Stacy, you're from the New York area, correct? Right. I grew up on Long Island, Plainview, Long Island, or as I always say, exit 46 of the Long Island Expressway. My parents were not musicians. They were artistically minded. So they played a lot of music in the house when I was growing up. My father tended towards classical music and jazz. My mother tended towards folk, show tunes, even Interestingly, some gospel, I, I remember Mahalia Jackson records. So I had this cross section. Then I started playing piano when I was about eight. I had been flunked out of the band program in fourth grade in public school and sent home. I was studying the flute and couldn't make heads or tails of the thing. And I was dropped by the teacher with a note saying, please return Stacy's flute. He exhibits no musical ability whatsoever which was very funny, but... How did you handle that? You didn't give up, clearly. Well, what happened was it didn't really, you know, I had a mixed relationship with school already by that point. And my cousin was a child prodigy classical pianist. And so he would have been about 14 at the time, and I was about eight. And my father had picked up an old Wurlitzer upright piano and my cousin was stuck in our house in a snowstorm with his mother, my aunt. And he's downstairs playing Chopin and all this stuff. And I was just enthralled. And he's watching me. And he said, oh, let me, let me see if I can teach you something. So Seth taught me how to play chopsticks, my cousin. And I picked it up fast. So he said, oh, let's see what else. And there was a method book that my parents had gotten. And so he was showing me stuff that suddenly clicked in my head that didn't make sense when I was trying to do it with the flute, like even where middle C was, you know. After about an hour, he ran upstairs and told my parents that they need to get me piano lessons because he said he just went through the first 10 weeks of the method book in an hour. The piano teacher was an interesting guy. He wasn't the typical classical. He, he had three jobs. He taught piano at night, going home to home. On the weekends, he played weddings and bar mitzvahs on Long Island. And during the day, he was a barber. 
but he did something okay. that was very unusual for beginning teachers that I owe him a debt of gratitude for my entire life, which is he taught me theory from a very early age. He started teaching me chord structure, what constitutes a triad, a major triad, a minor triad, all these things. And it, it later that became so valuable because it was most kids were learning that by, you know, when they got to high school and here I was in junior high school already knowing all this stuff. And what also helped was I found out that I had perfect pitch. I could hear a note on the piano and tell you what it was. And that was discovered by the school music teacher, Mrs. Harrington. Uh, she played a note on the piano. She said, some musicians, if I just play this note, they can tell you what it is. And me being you know, a wise ass, I yelled out, that's an A. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, can you see the keyboard? And I said, no. And she said, how did you know it was an A? And I said, I just know. Oh, and then man. she tried out some other notes and she said, you have perfect pitch. You should tell your piano teacher. So that helped me in terms of being able to figure out chords and songs and all this. I could I could hear it. So does it bother you when something's a little out of tune? Oh, yeah. I'm oh, like, yeah. really bad? Like, it, Well, it, it can't. And it was funny when I was the accompanist of my high school choir which was an excellent choir. The choir director, Mr. Cohen, used to lean down because I'd be sitting at the piano and he said, somebody's out in, in the Sopranos, who is it? And I'd say, it's Audrey again. Uh, and so, you know, something like this. <laughs> and so he'd say, Audrey, you're sharp. And she would just stare at me because she knew right. I was the, you know. But yeah, so I was doing stuff in school, playing, accompanying kids and, you know, and, and all this. And I was involved in theater productions in school. And then I started going to this arts and science camp during the summers called the Fidel School. I think it was in that time period when I was about 12 or 13 that I said, this is what I'm going to do for my life. And uh, much to my parents' chagrin, but they knew I was stubborn. And then I started playing clubs and getting paid for it when I was 15. And actually joined the Musicians Union, Local 802 in New York when I was 15 years old. So from that point on, it was just, you know, a, a fait accompli uh, that it was going to happen. Then I started writing music and getting paid for it when I was 19 for a little recording studio in Stanford, Connecticut. Which is right then, near where we're recording here. Yeah, in Connecticut. That's right. And then that studio expanded into doing industrial shows. And I, I quit college after two years thinking... Well, I'm working. Why do I need a degree? Let's just get a jump on career. And then got the opportunity with my then girlfriend, Wendy, to write the theme for the Richard Simmons show, which then became a hit. And that prompted us to move to L.A. the next year. Nowadays, you are in Nashville. John, you're from New York area as well, right? Yes, I am. Tell us about your background. When did music become the thing mm -hmm. for you? Like, when did you know this was going to be something you're going to do full time? Yeah, that was early on. I'd say like seven, seven or eight years old. I just picked up a guitar and, you know, started plucking. I had no idea what I was doing. And and I, I don't know, music music just hit me. Gosh, I, I can remember hearing like Pretty Woman, you know, the um, Roy Orbison song. And just, I don't know, it somehow seemed like that. that I guess I just knew that then. It's there's some kind of loose attachment to love and girls and women and with music, with, you know, just, you know, you hear those songs when you're, I don't know, that's how it hit me. And I was like, wow, yeah. this is, uh, this, this is big. This means something to me. So I, I had tunnel vision my whole life, really. It's, it's almost sad at this point. I'm, I'm like constantly, still music just going I, I have a studio in the barn and it's just uh you know and and at some point it's like you know we we stacy and i got really lucky because you know you could actually still make money off songwriting you know these days with streaming it's it's just uh it's dissolved it's it's hardly there but i still do it just because i love i just love doing it so i i always knew always you know always knew i wanted to play i i 
I was a mediocre musician um, until I was like, you know, 18 or 19. And then I really, I, I actually settled down with my bass and I studied a lot. <laughs> I early on, I got somebody like Stacy who turned me on this book. I wish I could find it. I can't find it anymore, but it was all music theory and, and teaching the modes. Soon, as soon as you know the modes, it really starts to make a lot of sense that, you know, now, you know, the in C major just started on D from D to D and now you're Dorian, you're, you're minor, you know, it just, that just opened up a lot for me. And that was early on. I had a bass teacher lived in Glen Cove actually, who, who got turned me on to that book and I still don't know the name of the book anymore. So it's about basically song structure, how to, how to write music how to understand uh, no, not, music no, or what, what's no. mode for those of us who are uh, not mode musicians. Is, a mode is a scale. Okay. Uh, basically like we think of a C major scale. What John was just saying, That's you know, ionic like D to D, you do. Major. It sounds, it's still a scale and it sounds different, but you can use it. In, and it's, that's the basis of a lot of Miles Davis's work, uh, later work, and um, uh, John Coltrane. So a mode is a scale. A lot of them have Greek names because they actually do go all the way back to classical Greek times. But if you just play, just play the uh, C major, uh, no, play a D minor triad. There. I mean, that, that's just, if you're in the key of C, that's just the, the second note in that scale and uh what is the second fourth and sixth note if you bring that down a whole step but so that's minor it's hard it's too hard to explain yeah, yeah. yeah there's a lot to it's, it you know they're all mathematical relationships basically but then you have to take all of that complex language musical language and then to connect with the everyday person like myself you know i love music i can't live without it but what is it that I'm connecting to? It's got to be something emotional. So you got to yeah. put those two together. Well, the, the the different chords, you know, and melt into the way a chord, the way a melody sits on a chord, and that progression, that can just pull on your heartstrings. It's just it just I don't know why it just does. Yeah, it's it's totally abstract, which is I think why music is so universal. Every culture has music in one form or another. And every culture can enjoy another culture's music because it is abstract. It's it's not having to do with translation or anything like that. Yeah, you it, can't put it into words. And it's yeah. Just... When you mention about, you know, putting that language together to create, that's the intellectual side of it. The emotional side of it is still, hey, does this sound good? And like, does it move you? <laughs> yeah, and does it move you me? Moved by it. John, according to your website, you played bass with Paul Young and Corey Hart, and then it was during that chapter of your career that you co-wrote I've Had the Time of My Life in Hungry Eyes with Frankie Previtt and Donald Markowitz, correct? Right. I've Had the Time of My Life was among 150 songs submitted as the main song for the Dirty Dancing film. Goes on to win a string of awards, including the Academy Award for Best Original Song and Grammy Award for Best Pop Performance by a duo or group with vocals. The vocals, of course, coming from Bill Medley and Jennifer Warrens. Can you talk about how this song all came together? Frankie had the lyrics written. You came up with the music. Did that come to you quickly? Do you recall how that all came together? For the time of my life, actually, the, the lyrics came after the music. They did. Okay. Uh, Donald Markowitz and I uh, got to, we had, Frankie and, or, and I had already written Hungry Eyes together for Frankie to try and get a record deal. So we had just started working together. And uh, maybe not just started. We had written about eight or nine tunes together. And he got a call during that from Jimmy Einer, who was the musical supervisor on the movie. And he said, we need this song. They've been listening to songs and they can't find the song for this final scene in the movie. And so they explained to Frankie what uh, Jimmy explained. They needed it to start slow and and then get, you know, get into a dance thing. And, and uh, that the guy, Johnny, uh, you know, was accused of stealing lots, just a really basic stripped down version of what it was. And so I, I got a hold of my friend, Donald Markowitz, and um, he had a, a drum machine and an eight track tape recorder. 
I, we were working together. So I, I just went over to his place and we just started jamming out this music. So basically, if you take the vocal off and just listen to the music, that's what Donnie and I came up with. We added the string parts We and, and then we sent it to Frankie and Frankie jammed with it. And I guess what they call top lined it and started singing to the track that Donald and I put together. That's how the song came about. And then they had submitted 150, that's what we heard, 150 songs. They listened to it. And, they, you know, they were depressed because the next day they had to, they were filming at a sequence and they were going to have to do the dirty dance, the time of my life sequence or what became the time of my life, the, the closing sequence. And they were uh, still dancing to a temp song by Lionel Richie. And then this song, one of the last cassettes they put in, that's how long ago it was. It was on a cassette. They put it in, and um, as soon as they put it in, Eleanor Bergstein, uh, Kenny Ortega, Emil Ardolino, they all went, "This is the song that we have." It. They all, they were, they were elated that they were able to find the song. Finally, we had to fine tune it. We had to slow it down. We added more percussion. They wanted more Latin percussion, which didn't end up in the final. But they want Kenny wanted more Latin percussion in it and stuff, and. The rest is history. They they filmed the movie to the demo. So Patrick and uh, when you see Patrick mouthing words, it's it looks like it's out of sync because he's singing to the demo that we did, which Frankie Previtt sang. Frankie and my friend Rochelle Capelli sang the demo, and that's what they and, and they were kind of locked into that demo for a while. They got a little bit of demoitis and was a little slower to to uh, get on board with the Jennifer Warren's Bill Medley version, but of course. Frankie sang it up an octave, so they were in the same range with Bill. Bill brought it down, so that really set up the projection of Johnny and Baby, you know. So I think that really worked. And you and Frankie wrote Hungry Eyes. Eric Carmen initially turned it down? Something like that. Yeah, we were supposed to, Frankie was supposed to sing it. And Eric was like, I, I don't like to do songs that I haven't written. You know, he wanted to do his own songs, which I don't blame him. But, um, you know, I, I don't think he had a, a whole bunch of things going on at that moment. So Jimmy said, you know, you, sh you should do this. And, and he did. And we went in to see Emil and Eleanor for a music for another scene. I think it was actually it. what ended up being the I carried the watermelon scene. And when we went in to go listen to that or look at that scene, we were saying, well, yeah, we're going to go into the studio tomorrow and start cutting Hungry Eyes. And Emil went, uh, no, we we already we already have that. Eric Carmen did it. So we didn't even know. They just kind of did that behind our back. And then there's the third smash hit single. And we go to Stacy for that one. She's like the wind, sung and co-written with the late great Patrick Swayze. And the story behind this song is fascinating, Stacy. You had a chance meeting with Patrick that leads to this song, and it wasn't initially intended for Dirty Dancing. Is that the other part of this story? Yeah, basically, my then girlfriend and I, Wendy, who's a great singer who sings on She's Like the Wind, we moved to L.A. after we had written the theme for the Richard Simmons show, and that show became a hit. So we're writing music for TV. And another friend of mine who was a very good musical comedy guy asked me to play piano for him in his acting class because uh, he wanted to do a, a musical scene from Shenandoah. And he knew I was an accomplished accompanist. So I did the scene in the class, and there were like 60 students in the class, very famous acting teacher named Milton Katselis. And it turned into a discussion about theater and music and theater. And the teacher brought me into the discussion. We, you know, it was an interesting conversation. And the class took a break, and I was gathering up the music. And this guy came over to me and he said, Hi, I'm Buddy. I really liked your playing and what you were saying about music. I said, you know, you look really familiar to me. He said, well, have you seen The Outsiders? And I said, no. And he mentioned a couple of other things that I'd never seen. And then a blonde woman came over and he said, this is my wife, Lisa. And I said, okay, now I, I have it. The, the two of you are always working on your black Datsun 240Z on the weekends on La Jolla Avenue. And so they said, yeah, how do you know that? And I said, I live right around the block from you. I oh. see you every weekend. So we live two houses away. And so, <laughs> so he thought you saw him in the movies. 
Right, right. He thought I live he was right getting annoyed that I would had not seen him in the movie. <laughs> yeah, Outsiders, not... by the way, is just a classic. I love the yeah, Outsiders. Yeah. So anyway, so the four of us started hanging out. We talked about music and theater. I had somewhat of a background in music for dance as well, having worked with the Jose Limon Dance Company in New York. So we became fast friends. And then probably another year went by, and he was doing a movie called Grandview USA with Jamie Lee Curtis and Tommy Howell. And he called me up. He said, oh, they're looking for songs for Grandview. I've had this idea for a song for a couple of years, but I, I can't get anywhere with it. Do you want to work on it with me? So I said, yeah, sure. You know, come on over. I, I knew he was musical, that he'd been on Broadway, that he played some guitar. So he came around the block with his guitar and I was at the piano and he had two chords only, but lots of lyrics, like four line stanzas. And the first couple of lines where she's like the wind through my tree, she rides the night next to me. And I didn't like the third and fourth lines and said so. And he said, well, what would you say? So I said, she leads me through moonlight only to burn me with the sun. He said, what does that mean? And I said, I don't care, just write it down. Then when we, we started to move it to another place musically, and then when we realized that She's Like the Wind could be the hook for the song, not just the opening line, that it could be the, the title, that's when we knew we kind of had something. And we did a really good demo of it at the time with him singing it, Wendy doing some backgrounds in this little duet with him that ended up in the final version. I programmed the synths, brought in a guitarist, but then it wasn't used in Grandview and it sat around for a couple of years. And then he called me from the set of Dirty Dancing in Lake Lure and said, oh, they want it for this movie. And I knew about the film. And so that's how it ended up in Dirty Dancing, but with no expectations because the word on the street was, this is a bad movie that's going straight to video after one week. That's amazing. And, yeah, yeah, I read that. Yeah, nobody, nobody knew. It just and then it exploded and everybody was just surprised. Uh, Patrick, probably most of all, but it was it was an amazing story and and how it just spread like wildfire. And I was just in London and Paris. I was sitting at a cigar lounge in London and there was a guy sitting across from me and he found out, you know, what I do and what I've done. He sang me the whole song. That's great. You know, that, it, was, it was crazy. And I said, do you know how surreal this is? That all these years later, there's a guy sitting across from me in St. James, London, upstairs from where Churchill used to smoke cigars, and he's singing me She's Like the Wind. So it, it's crazy. The Booked on Rock podcast will be back after this. I know you got to run. You got maybe a minute or two left. So maybe we should sneak in a few good stories from you, Stacy, and then I'll pick things up with John. But you had some stories we were talking about before we jumped down with John. There's Jeff Skunk Baxter you're friends with, but the other one was I think we wanted to talk about the Ray Manzarek story, right? Because you, yeah, this... your main thing is, and photography has been your recent passion, but your your main thing is writing music for television and movies. So, so that's where right. this Ray Manzarek well, story comes in, right? Right. It, it was scoring work, writing music to picture, which is a very different mindset than songwriting. Very technical very collaborative. It's it's interesting. So anyway, I was at this point represented by the William Morris Agency. And I had a great agent, Joel, who's still my great friend to this day. I was working on a show for NBC called Erie, Indiana, which I absolutely loved because it was like the Twilight Zone meets the Wonder Years. I actually think it was the model for the show Stranger Things. So I'm working on scoring work is incredibly intense labor intensive, time intensive, you're under tremendous deadlines. So there's no waiting for inspiration or wasting time. You've got to get the job done. My phone rang, it was Joel. And he said, you know, I've got a guy in my office who comes more from the rock world. And uh, he's interested in learning about how scoring works. And I figured that since you're working on Erie, maybe he could come over to your place and watch you work. And I said, I don't know, Joel, you know, I don't know if I want somebody else in the room with me. I don't, I don't know if I can handle that. So I said, who is it? And he said, it's Ray Manzarek. And I said, Ray Manzarek of the Doors is sitting in your office right now. <laughs> when I was 12, 
maybe even 11, I figured out all the keyboard parts on the Strange Days album of The Doors, which is still one of my favorite records. So this was a guy who played a big part, you know, in my childhood musical growth. So I said, yeah, he can come over. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next day, Ray shows up at my place. Very nice guy. He was very polite. He asked a couple of questions along the way, but otherwise I was working. And he would say, well, what are you doing there? Because I could do in that show, because it was kind of science fiction-y, I could do very complex music that was harmonically in a whole different thing with, you know, what you can do with suspense and sci-fi. And when so, was this? I'm sorry, Stacey, when was this? this? About 1990. Okay, 90. Yeah, about 1990. At one point, it was funny. I said, okay, I need to take a break. I'm going to make some tea. Let's just go have some tea and sit for a half an hour in the living room. We can chat. We talked a lot about the uh, Oliver Stone movie of The Doors, which uh, Ray had his name taken off of it because mm. uh, he felt it was a very inaccurate representation of Jim Morrison. Wow. Uh, after, you know, like 15 minutes, it's peer to peer. I mean, it's, yes, it's my one of my idols, but we're professionals. But then finally, I looked at him and I said, you have to give me 30 seconds. And he said, for what? And I said, just give me 30 seconds. So he said, OK. And I looked at the floor and I just said, I can't believe Ray Manzarek is in my apartment. <laughs> I can't. And I repeated this about 10 times. And then I looked at him and I said, OK, I'm done. <laughs> like this, he was laughing and he came over again the next day it was you know similar and then the, the fun upshot to the whole thing was about a month later i was standing online in a music equipment store west la music and i'm on line at the counter to buy some cables or something and i hear this buzz and i hear all these people saying it's ray manzarek it's ray manzarek so i turn and there's ray at the doorway with the manager of the store, whom I also knew, Mark. And Ray's looking around and he saw me online and he pointed at me and he yelled out, get that man some service. That man <laughs> is a genius like this. And everybody's staring at me and I'm like this. <laughs> but he was such a gracious, you know, nice person. And really when you listen to what he did on those records, it was pretty remarkable. He's playing bass at the same time at a lot of on a lot of the records. Very intelligent guy. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. like another friend of yours, Jeff Skunk Baxter, a defense right. consultant. <laughs> yes, Jeff is an interesting person. We met also through my agent in 1988, and we became well. We we were then hired to work together on a TV show called TV 101, which I think was Matt LeBlanc's first TV show. I'm not sure. We just hit it off. I'm very into world history and the English language and, you know, different than so is Jeff. And, you know, he was telling me about the work that he does with his, the Defense Department. And I'm thinking he's out of his mind. He's had, <laughs> he's one of these people. He smokes a lot of pot. He's, he's got the tinfoil hat on. <laughs> right. But then I was at his house uh, that he rented a part of a house. And at that time, he had a studio in there. And there's a fax machine. And a fax starts to roll in from Washington, D.C. with like a, you know, the whole thing. And I'm reading it thinking, I don't even know if I should be reading this. <laughs> and he and I thought, this is for real. He's yeah. not joking. And at that time, he was still smoking a tremendous amount of pot. And then one day we were hired to work together again. And I said, where's the joint? And he said, I, I quit. And I said, really? health and he said no higher security clearance mm. <laughs> so uh he had moved up in the organization so he had to give up all drugs and mm. uh, but to this day he can board a plane carrying a gun one time i called him on his cell phone which he calls the bat phone and i said where are you and uh he said i'm in afghanistan and i said where in afghanistan he says i can't tell you that wow so mm. it's it's really fascinating but incredibly intelligent guy and on top of that you know one of the, just the best rock guitarists there ever was mm -hmm. steely dan doobie brothers yep. yeah people know fans of those bands certainly know who he is and then before we let you go stacy yep. i want to give you a chance to plug whatever you have going on your website but since this is a podcast on books would you ever write a book about yourself 
or your career? Yeah, I'm being urged to do that, actually, and make it a combination of my photography, which is my new found passion, and stories from my career growing up. I even have a title for it, which is taken from a, a true experience. When I was about 18 and playing clubs on Long Island, I was walking in Bayville on the North Shore of Long Island with my father. And we passed a restaurant and there was a sign in the window that said, piano player wanted, must know how to open clams. <laughs> and so that is going to be the title for the book where it's it's like, and my, I remember my father looked at me, says, I don't want to see you opening clams. You better up your game. <laughs> well, you know, um, you're welcome here to promote it when that comes well, out. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. But uh, yeah, it, 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 it would be a fun project to do. And, you know, sometimes you think to yourself, oh, who really wants to read this stuff? You know, something like that. But, you know, like I was recently at a high school reunion and you realize the careers that John and I and Frankie have had. This is not the usual thing. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not what, what most people do. People love so, great stories. Yeah. So it is it is pretty fascinating. So uh, have me back whenever you want. This is Open a invite. Yeah. And so your website, where can people reach you and anything you want to promote? You've got the photography, which is fantastic, yeah. by the way, which we were talking about before. It's great work. If, if anybody's passing through Nashville Airport between now and the end of February, I have an exhibit of my work up at the airport www.stacywidelitz.com. There's a mixture of stories and photos. And then if you put my name into uh, Instagram, that's where I keep my most up-to-date work. Like I, I just posted a photo from Paris, I think this morning or yesterday. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 a blast. So people yeah. can follow that way. Yeah, I'll, I'll put the links in the show notes page, but it is spelled W-I-D-E-L-I-T-Z. Yeah, W-I-D-E-L-I-T-Z. Yeah. Pronounced yeah. wide lits. Yeah. Right. All right, Cece, we'll let you go. And, uh, and, and John's going to hang out for a little bit longer, but thank you so much. And we had a great discussion sure. about our love of old movies, black and white movies before we yeah. started. So yeah. we, we got lots more to talk about in the future. That's great. That's great. All right. Well, Thanks. Great to see you, John, as always. Yes, yeah, Stacy. See ya. So yeah, John, you released a solo album in 2019 called the why, because this is a collection comprised largely of your originals. It also includes, I've had the time of my life. You're a songwriter, you're a producer, you're the founder of the indie label Omad Records. You discovered and fostered the careers of many acts, including a band called Kara's Flowers or Kara's Flowers. Yeah, either one. Either one. But we know who they became, they said, yeah. Maroon yeah. 5. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about your history with that band? You produced an early album by them, and they were just teenagers, right? Yeah, they were like 15, 16 years old. Um, yeah, we, we went out, uh, the guy, a, a, a friend of mine that was uh, part of, our, we had a production team together, um, Tommy Allen, was living in Malibu, and he had was walking along the beach, and he heard this music coming from somewhere, and he went to this garage and just introduced himself, and it was Carol's Flowers, and he was just so blown away by what he was hearing. We took him into the studio. We we did the first day. We, we you know it was just to to see if we liked working. You know if they liked us, we liked them. We went into Sound City, Sound City, the famous studio, and we did like four demos that day, and they were really into it. They loved it. So we we recorded over the next number of months uh, a whole record with you know overdubbing, and we did all you know spent a lot of time on it. You know it didn't. It's a long story, but they didn't get off the ground yet. But I, I knew immediately that the, the talent with Adam Levine, I mean, it was just, you know, obvious. He was overflowing with ideas and a great guitarist, great writer. In fact, he recently, not so long ago, when he was still on The Voice, they asked them, who was your chair turn around person? You know how they, somebody. Right. And uh, he said, yeah, that would that would be uh, John D. Nicole and Tommy Allen. They were the first ones to get us in the studio and 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 acknowledge our, you know, what we had. So that, oh, that's that, awesome. That was, yeah. Yeah. But uh, they were they were that was a fun process. The, the record sounded great, had a lot of uh, young energy and but, they you know, they just didn't get off the ground. And, and then they ended up on Warner Brothers and then they disbanded and then reformed. Two of them 
came to the East Coast and went to a, a school in uh, on Long Island. They got a little more uh, R and B influenced there uh, on the East Coast, and uh, took that back with them and, and reformed as Maroon Five. Same four guys, and then they added in another guitarist. So just extremely talented the whole band. And the songs that you produced on that album, they end it, those ended up on their debut major label album. Some of them, some, just okay. a few, but they they ended up re-recording most of them with Rob Cavallo who had produced Green Day and a couple of others. And uh, interestingly enough, I, I maybe a few years later, because that kind of, they spent a lot of time trying to re-record. And Rob's dad, Bob Cavallo, uh, said to us, man, but they should have just put that record out, the, the one we did, because it had, it had that, you know, it's hard to go and re-record songs you recorded already, you know. There was this youthful excitement you could hear in our tracks that was kind of lost, you know, by by re-recording and taking another year and a half. And in that year and a half, the music scene changed a little bit, too. So, you know, they I think they would have been, you know, there was a few songs that did survive, but most of it was uh, redone and, and not as good. And they, I think they came out just before the, the streaming took over i th i believe i mean it, it, to to a band or an artist who's just getting into the business now or they want to they want to mm -hmm. do this full time i mean what what do you what's your advice i mean it's a whole different world now it's a, it's tough uh you know i i, I can't see that this is going to stay like this because I, I don't know how anybody there's not enough money to be made it, it, the, with this current you know, the, the way it's set up with streaming, there's just, I feel like something's going to give somewhere along the line. You know, the Spotify's are making plenty of money, but when you get down to the artist, the, you know, it's the sliver gets really slim, which is ridiculous. We're talking yeah. about thousands of a penny for a dream. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's unsustainable for anybody, a, a new artist coming out. I mean, what they end up, what your recording ends up doing is being a calling card for your live show, I guess. Well, now. that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Do you, do you suggest do you develop a great live show Yeah. and then have the music just be something that is, is just something for the fans to have or a reason to go out and tour? I don't yeah. know. It's, it's all. Yeah. But then again, I, how, how do you build an audience as a live act without having a hit single? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And you know, where is the airplay uh, these days? I mean, you have iHeartRadio making the decisions for the whole, you know, all their stations, like one guy's making a decision. So gone is the local radio station playing the local band that breaks, you know, explodes out of that area. That's all gone because you're not going to get those songs on iHeartRadio. It's going to be, you know, it's it's all going to be major label stuff. And it's changed a lot. And uh, I, I always like to say to people, uh, if you like a band and you're, you want to support them, go to iTunes and down buy the record and download it or buy a CD that they have or an LP that they have because the streaming is, it's not sustainable. It's not enough money. So yeah. I know it's tough. I'd hate. I wouldn't. I wouldn't love to be uh, uh, starting out in this climate. But you know, when when you have the music in you, you're gonna do it. The Book Done Rock Podcast will be back after this. You were nice enough to give me a list of books that you've read. I think you've read all of these books, so these are good recommendations. You have anything for a hit? An A and R Woman's Story of Surviving the Music Industry. Dorothy Carvello, that's from 2018, deserves, got nothing to do with it. Five Elements That Will Help You Survive Your Emotional Journey to Success by Charlie Midnight, 2021, Bloody Crossroads, 2020, Art, Entertainment, and Resistance to Trump from 2021 by Danny Goldberg, <laughs> The Real Frank Zappa Book by the man himself, Frank Zappa. That goes back to 90, 1990. Music and Revolution, Greenwich Village in the 1960s. That's from 2022 by Richard Barone. I'd love to read that one. Here's one I, I have read. I have it. Sound Man, A Life, Recording Hits with the Rolling Stones, The Who, Led Zeppelin, The Eagles, Eric Clapton, The Faces by Glenn Johns. That's a great book. 
2015. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Al Schmidt on the record, The Magic Behind the Music by Al Schmidt, 2018. View from the Bottom, 50 Years of Bass Playing with Bob Dylan, The Doors, Miles Davis, and everybody else from 2020 by Harvey Brooks. Here, There, and Everywhere, My Life Recording the Music of the Beatles, 2007 by Jeff Emmerich. And I think this is the last one. All You Need is Ears, the inside personal story of the genius who created the Beatles, 1994 from George Martin. Big Beatles fan, I'm assuming. Yeah. Which era of the Beatles is your favorite? Um, you always say Revolver is like that first, Revolver, it's like the yeah. first classic rock album. Pretty amazing when you go back. You know, I, I was, I'm a funny Beatles fan because I, I may not have been that excited about them as a youngster, I, I sort of, uh, as I grew as a songwriter, I began to uh, kind of look back at it and realize just how, you know, they're, they're in their own category. There's no one, nobody touches them. They're the best. And it, it's, it, you know, it was, it was a couple of things. I mean, it, it, you, first of all, you had John and Paul who were super, talented just uh, you know it's like having two mozarts in the same band i mean they're just and then you realize how much george contributed and yes. and and then you realize how uh, you know ringo was a superb drummer i i think he doesn't get as much credit as he should his approach first of all his timing is impeccable he's Oh, he does these kind of elaborate fills. Not that they're technically amazing, but they're so tasteful and such a big part of the Beatles sound. And he's able to do them and be not change the time. The time stays like a clock. He does this rim shot sound. Almost every hit he, he hits is like a, that's what gives the Beatles uh, that sound. I mean, it, it was just a, a a lineup of the stars and the sun and just that those four got together and produced the music that they made. My first time around as a kid, I guess I noticed them the most with Magical Mystery Tour. I don't know why, but that, that one grabbed me. You know, and then, then now I, I'll go back to, I, I don't think I could pick an era, but but I, I didn't focus enough as I was younger on Revolver. And I mean, the innovations on that record, there's so many sonic innovations. And then, of course, Rubber Soul. So I, I don't think I can give an answer to that. I, yeah. Uh, Somebody recently talked about how insane it is to think about how incredibly fast they evolved in that short period <laughs> that they existed so, as... As Seven or eight years, yeah. But you know, even early on, they were so innovative. If yes. To what was the uh, like? What was the what's the album with like Babies in Black and Oh and, yeah. I mean that that's those they were playing chord changes that nobody was hearing. You know what I mean? They came out of you know right then we're we're talking uh, you know rhythm and blues and fifties and and they and they took that. Those influences, you know, which they admit was, you know, Little Richard and, um, you know, uh, Buddy Holly and, and stuff like that. But they they took the American, you know, Americans took kind of blues chord changes and and uh, evolved on that or expounded on that. But they took it and they evolved the blues in a way and, and added a, a little bit of. English folk to it, some, mm -hmm. some, uh, yeah, the Dylan influences there. Dylan influence, yep. and, and but they would always take a turn that was a little different, even early on. That was Beatles for Sale, by the way, 1964. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, great, great songs. What else was on that? There, there, uh, there's the song listing there. That, yeah, let's see. No reply. I'm a loser. Wow. Babies in Black, Rock and Roll Music, which is the Chuck Berry cover. I'll Follow the Sun, Mr. Moonlight, Kansas City. Hey, 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 hey. Side two, eight days a week. Worlds of Love, Buddy Holly cover. Honey, don't. Carl Perkins, that's another one there. Sure. Yeah. Every, every little thing. I don't want to spoil the party. What you're doing, everybody's trying to be my baby, Carl Perkins. I think in a way, uh, 
at least some of the John songs, I think that was his take on Dylan. You know what I mean? And uh, but you can hear the, you can see the traditional, you know, little Kansas City and the Carl Perkins song, and then you hear the little odd chord changes that they would add to to like um, you know the the songs, some of the songs you mentioned, and you know it was just it was it was it was like a rocket ship from there, and you know Paul obviously is just an amazing musician play piano pick up bass pick up guitar you know a lot of times he was he's playing the solos on some of that early stuff but i won't say but i'll say and john was there too i mean he'll pick up a piano he'll pick up a bass he'll pick up a guitar but john would always have that like out of nowhere chord change you know and melodic change that sort of defied you know, pop or, you know, rock or even classical. It just, it just was, you know, uniquely him yeah. that, that he'd come with these chord changes and, and melodies that, you know, you, you just don't normally, you know, it's, it's out of the box. He, he was an out of the box writer. What did I, you think of what they did with his song now and then? You know what? I, I love it. People don't, there's a lot of people critical of you know how Paul did it and and you know John didn't really finish the song so what did they do? I you know I, I'll take what I can get from sure. both guys at this point. I liked it. I liked that. I, 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 my only complaint would be, and I guess I guess you have to do it that way. It was a little to me it was a little too modern sounding. The drums were a little too big and the production was a little too compressed. I, I would like to have. Heard it, but I, you know, I guess you can't go back and and try and sound like it did. But it was a little too heavy-handed for me sonically. But I'm a, I love it. I'm, I'm appreciative right. of it. I'm glad they did it. I'm glad you know I can hear Ringo's voice in that chorus, and I love it. I bought it. I have the LP, one oh, side, cool. their first song ever, which is think is uh, is it please please me? I, I can't remember what's on side one, and side two is. Uh, then and now a vinyl that you know cut at 45 rpm so um i love it yeah i mean just to think in the year 2023 there's a brand new yeah. Beatles song that's that's yeah. pretty cool that is pretty cool and paul mccartney and ringo are still touring regularly yeah. and recording I, yeah. yeah that's pretty cool i so love it let's plug anything you want to plug because I, I should mention too because i did want to and i mentioned this to Stacey earlier we should get out there uh you know what people can do as far as pancreatic cancer and you're fighting because I know my, my mom's neighbor was only m like my age early 50s and he's he's got it so I know that you've you've got involved with this Patrick sadly passing 09 from it and I know that you have both you and Stacey along with Frankie done some great work for uh, it's called PanCan the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network PanCan.org is the website but what can people do to to help educate themselves about it is it is it preventative it's very difficult to detect i think what stacy told me earlier right and by the time it's detected it's kind of gotten to a bad state uh I, frankie has been more involved in this he's he's set up uh, we have our, our dirty dancing demos for sale and 100 percent of those demo sales goes to the pancreatic cancer uh, network i think it, you can you can just put in dirty dancing demos on Facebook and find that to contribute to. But again, that was more Frankie's. I, th I think through the years we, we've, and it's been a good chunk of money from the sales that have gone to that. But, you know, as far as uh, what I've been doing, uh, I, I have the OMAD records, omadrecords.com, uh, where I, I've been working with different artists and recording, uh, producing and recording in my studio out here. And uh, we're actually working on a, a, a documentary on Peter Lewis, who was one of the founders of Moby Grape. Moby Grape, okay. So 1960s band that Peter's uh, mother was Loretta Young, who was an Academy Award winning actress. And then Peter was in Moby Grape. And it, it's a documentary, but it's it's really more about Peter's daughter, Arwen, came to him at like 26 years old and said teach me to play guitar teach me to write and 
And so it's like a, it, it, the documentary is entitled Fall on You, which is a, a, one of the bigger songs Moby Grape did that Peter wrote f- was called Fall on You. So it's it's really more about a story about a, a father, daughter, and the sort of passing of the torch from his actress mom to him and then him to his daughter. And both of them are on my record label, uh, both Arwen and, and Peter. And uh, I just finished the Peter Peter Lewis record, which has got some great reviews. And Peter's kind of like a kind of like a Neil Young, uh, you know, he's he's a hero to uh a certain crowd of people that were into the into the 60s San Francisco sound. Although Moby Grape and and a guy named Skip Spence who was in Moby Grape was also very influential to the next few generations. I know Beck and uh, people like that. Skip Spence was Jefferson Airplane, right? Wasn't he in the He was the original drummer. Right. And then he be, then he went off and played guitar with Mo- started the band Moby Grape. Okay. And, yeah, I mean, Moby Grape was just tied in. They, they were just all, they were the first band out of the San Francisco scene to get signed. And they had a bidding war uh, for them, but uh, everything went wrong. Uh, the, the first thing was the label uh, put out, instead of putting out one single and at a time, they put they, they had the bright idea to put out five singles at once. So nobody knew which song to play. Oh, wow. That's, that's odd. Just, and that's just one of the problems. There was so many problems. But they if you talk to Robert Plant, if you talk to Stephen Van Zandt, you know, little Stephen, if you talk to Chrissy Hind, if you talk to it, there were just so many people influenced by Moby Grape. If, if you haven't heard their first record, you, you should go listen to it, it, which is hard to find because it's not on spot it's on Spotify, but only a few of the songs that no one knows why you can't get the whole record there but if you can get a hold you can go on youtube i guess and hear the whole record but uh, there there are you know guys like david frick who who is uh, um rolling stone rolling stone he he's a huge huge fan we became friends through moby grape that first record is on a lot of people's um greatest but it might be on Ro- Rolling Stone's greatest one and the top 100 greatest albums ever done. Certainly, debut album. They were touted to be the the American version, Americans' answer to the Beatles. That was how that was touted. But really? Then, wow. And everything just <laughs> fell apart. And the website, omadrecords.com. And uh, I just recently put up, and I have to change the the name to it. But if you if you were to Google Fourth Wall F O U R T H Wall W A L L and put in OMAD Records at the same time, I, I just put up this website. It's it's a merch website, and it's got some really fun merch. And and and, and part of it is to do with I on my last record that I put out, which was. You mentioned the why because, but there's a, a record I did in 21, 2021 that's called She Said, and it's those were all songs I wrote for myself for the first time. Every, you know, the first record was songs I had written for other people that I was able to cover. Uh, this one was all songs I have written for myself, and there's a song on there called Float on Hope, and it's about kind of a you know it's a hopefully it's it's not a bonky on the head but it's it's about global climate change and i found this great animator after a long period of time to do a video uh it's called float on hope and it's it's on you can find it on youtube and jenna shot kind of translated our script we're using this mouse is the mouse from a mouse we always had this thought about uh, we have a friend of ours a close friend who's Brazilian and she's from the Amazon and she was from Manaus and we we have uh, in the video uh, the mouse from Manaus which sort of represents everybody on the planet earth <laughs> and he has to in the song as the song goes he has to leave his mom and everybody to try and find a place for humankind to move and and he ends up waking up out of this dream, but it's this young little mouse. Long story short, the images from the video we have on our merch 
translated to these really cool sneakers. I'm looking at it here. Yeah. The t-shirt. And t-shirts and stuff. And it's not the only thing. I mean, there's Peter Lewis stuff there. There's Arwen Lewis stuff there. But that that's just recently launched. Um, it, it's cool. Well, I'm happy to put a link up on the show notes page too. So people can just go right to the show notes page, click on the link there and the video too. a link it. people yeah. up to the video. Yeah. Very cool. And you know, one other thing I wanted to mention too, Frankie, you know, he wanted to be here. He was unable to, but he has an event coming up. We want to mention too. He's the co-producer of the upcoming Taylor Simon King tribute concert in New Jersey. That's Sunday, December 3rd, 3 PM at Raritan Valley community college. The celebration of the music of three American troubadours, James Taylor, Carly Simon, and Carol King. It's in honor of TAPS and honoring Gold Star fallen families of the U.S. military. So if you live in the New Jersey area, you want to go, head to taylorsimonking.com for more info. taylorsimonking.com and also link on the show notes page. And your main website is, I think, uh, John Dash. Yeah, it, you don't have to put the dash in, but it, yeah, yeah, it's either, either john dinacola.com or john dinacola.com. But um, yes, and, and then the OMAD Records is where I, I'm also. All right, John, thank you so much. And if Stacy's yeah. listening to this, thank you again. All right, nice meeting you. Well, now, that was an adventure. That was quite a show you put on today. Well, let me just close this conversation by saying you are one unique individual.